So, good afternoon. Welcome on behalf of the Bloomington Bach Cantata Project. I'm Dan Malamed, director. We present performances of cantatas by Johann Sebastian Bach, whose birthday we've just all recently observed, in performances modeled on his own. That is, using texts, considering versions, and using performing forces modeled on what research uh, tells us he did in his time to see what we can learn uh, about performing these about these pieces uh, by performing them in that way. Uh, and along with those performances, uh, we take the opportunity to learn a little something together about these pieces. This is a musical experience I think you will not find duplicated anywhere else. Um, this is our sixth and final performance of the regular season for 2021-22, but there will be a seventh performance, as I mentioned last time. The Bloomington Bach Cantata Project has the honor of opening the Bloomington Early Music Festival uh, in May, on uh, Sunday evening, May 22nd at 8 p.m. at the Far Center at Rogers and 4th Street. So 8 p.m. Uh, on May 22nd, uh, not in this place, but at the Far Center. Uh, the director will be Carol Ann Buff, professor at the School of Music. Uh, it's going to direct a cantata based on a text by Bach's only female librettist, Christiana Mariana von Ziegler, um, and it, that is in honor of the Early Music Festival's theme this year of women in early music. Please keep in mind the different time and date for that, and very soon you'll be able to see the entire festival program just announced last night, in fact, at the organization's website, blemp.org. One of the things you'll find in the program, stuffed into the program today, is a survey um, in which we ask you to tell us a little bit about yourself as an audience member and a few reactions. Uh, I know it can be annoying to keep filling out these surveys, but they really do help us a great deal because the grant-making organizations uh, to whom we apply and from whom we, we do get support want to know who our audience is, whom we're reaching, and one of the things we want to make sure to be able to show them is that our audience is diverse along um, uh, many axes and from many perspectives. So it really is a help for us if you do take a moment to fill out that survey and drop them in the box in the back. And sometime later in the day, we will also post this uh, online if it's easier for you to take it there. You'll find a link uh, on our Facebook page. Uh, speaking of the support we need to uh, make these cantatas possible, um, here we are at the end of our 12th season, uh, planning a 13th. Uh, to make that 13th season possible, a uh, 13th season will be, will be possible um, uh, only if we have sufficient support to do it. Um, is the microphone not working correctly? Maybe it shut itself off. Maybe it came back on now? Yeah. All right, sorry, sorry for that. Do you want me to start all over? No, you don't. No, no, you, no you don't. I know the answer. All right. Um, so we do want to present 13th season and beyond, uh, but we want to go beyond a uh, parade of cantatas, uh, one after the next. Um, of course, that's what we're here to do, is to uh, work our way through this whole repertory and learn how much there is to be uh, heard and discerned in all these pieces. Um, but there's some things we want to do to move this project forward. Um, one of them is that I feel a very strong need to improve the honorarium uh, we offer to our performers. Um, we're very grateful for their participation. Uh, we revel in the level of performance they bring here. We really do need to uh, bring the, our level of uh, acknowledgement of that in financial terms um, up because this is something these people love doing, but it is also how these musicians, young and old, are beginning to make their living. So I really do think it is time for us to continue to improve the uh, honorarium that we are offering each of our performers. Um, to give you an idea, to get to the level that I think it needs to be at, we need to raise about an additional $7,000 uh, each year. So for next year's budget, to get where I think it ought to be. Um, think about that a little bit differently. A gift of about $2,400 would offer a $25 um, uh, per cantata raise to every performer on every cantata next season. $2,400. Now, that is beyond what uh, many of us are in a position to donate. But not all of us. But not all of us. And I want to ask you to consider whether you are in a position to make a gift at that level to, uh, for this very specific purpose. So please come talk to me if, uh, afterwards if you would like. 
Um, we appreciate gifts on absolutely every level, um, whatever it is you are capable of offering. But stop to think, um, as you uh, generously uh, consider giving us a gift, uh, stop to think, what do I get from this? Do I want to see this continue? And I do, do I want to see it continue um, in a way that more fully respects the contributions, musical contributions made by our performers? Uh, the other thing that I am uh, looking to do is for us to bring a few more guest performers in from outside of Bloomington. And one of the reasons to do that uh, is that I want to bring performers from whom we, as listeners, and from whom our student performers can learn. And so there is another way to think about uh, the purposes to which uh, a substantial gift to the Pagata Project might go. Again, we appreciate gifts at every level. Your gifts are what has made, uh, made this possible. So if you want to make a, a gift, uh, information's in the program, by check to the address there. There's a donate button that you can reach through our Facebook page. Thank you for thinking of us. I'll say, as I always do, for those of you who might be new to us, that our routine is to hear a performance of a cantata, uh, a short talk about it, and then a second performance, and I can all but guarantee that you will hear new things uh, in that second performance. Thank you all for being here.
There's no such thing as a typical Bach cantata, and you know that if you've been attending these performances regularly, and you know that a great variety of things can happen in one of these pieces. But some things that happen are admittedly more common than others, and for the third time this season, we'd have what I really think we have to call a less than usual work. And that uh, feature that is less than usual lies in the nature of the text, Bach said. This is a five movement cantata that, as you can see from the program, sets all the verses of a hymn and nothing else. Now, by the time Bach was regularly producing cantatas, the ideal was the so-called mixed text type libretto. Mixing, that is, as we discover month after month, scriptural passages, hymn verses, and newly written poetry, and that led to a corresponding musical variety that appears to have been greatly valued in pieces like this. The newly written poetry prompted the uh, composition of opera-influenced recitatives and arias for solo voices, the scriptural passages evoke everything from motets to aria-like pieces to concerted choral movements. And the hymn stanzas that were included in these mixed text type librettos uh, uh, yielded musical movements ranging from simple harmonizations to elaborate concertos. For some reason, the libretto of today's cantata lacks that textual variety. It offers all five stanzas of a hymn from the late 17th century with a text on the subject of praise, and the text is ultimately psalm-inspired. This text also nicely refers to music and to musical instruments, and even presents the concluding amen as, a, as quoted words. It says, those of you who praise conclude with amen. That's a quoted word, not just a liturgical formula. It's part of the text. And so this reference to music and the musical instruments in the beginning, and this quoted amen, add to the sense that the music points to itself as the very words of praise that the text is urging. The melody of the chorale tune that's used pretty much throughout, uh, the melody is tuneful, it's in a major mode, it's in a dance-evoking triple meter. It's most definitely from the later part of the 17th century, even in fact in a version that didn't become codified into the, until the early 18th century. It's a far cry, for example, from the severe Luther-era tune, in fact, Luther tune, that we heard here last month as the basis of a cantata. And the cantatas that Bach produced from these two tunes, from these two chorale melodies, could hardly be more different. So this work is for the 12th Sunday after Trinity, and it's from Bach's third year in Leipzig. And one wonders, how did he end up setting this most atypical libretto? We have to guess, unfortunately. Uh, it's probably significant that we don't have a piece for this liturgical date, the 12th Sunday after Trinity, for the year before, that is from the second annual cycle that Bach composed. That's the one that was based, in fact, on chorales. We don't know what cantata he composed or performed that second year on the 12th Sunday after Trinity, and it's possible that he skipped the date for some reason. Um, evidently, he did not have, in any event, a characteristic libretto that fit that cycle. That is one that uses uh, all the stanzas of a hymn, but retains only its first and last stanzas, and paraphrases poetically the inner stanzas in newly written poetry that will yield um, arias and recitatives. Perhaps when this date came around again in his third year, he wanted to turn to a hymn, that had probably been the plan the previous year, but the poet who was responsible for that conversion of complete chorales into cantata, mixed text cantata librettos was no longer available. Um, you might recall that that cycle is incomplete. He got something like 40 pieces into it, the 60 or so it would take, 65 or so it would take to write a complete cycle, and then that type of piece breaks off. One of the suggestions is that perhaps the librettos died, and that the person who had been supplying those texts whose name is not known with any certainty, um, simply wasn't available one way or the other. So as in a few other works related to that second cycle, Bach took a chorale as the basis of, of a cantata, but simply set all the, uh, all the stanzas to music as he found them. 
Now the compositional task in a libretto like the one we have in front of us today is the same for the outer movements as in a sort of ordinary chorale cantata. Indeed, we get the expected concerto opening using voices and instruments together, um, organized around an opening instrumental ritornello, an instrumental passage that's uh, musically complete in itself that will recur throughout the movement. And equally usually, we find a final movement set as a simple chorale harmonization with almost doubling instruments. In this case, the uh, uh, instrumental doubling is slightly elaborated. We'll come back to that. The challenge for Bach, given a libretto like this, is setting the inner movements. He's got a strophic chorale text. They all imply the same melody, maybe even in the same key. And in this hymn, to make his job even more difficult, every stanza begins the same way. Loba de Hound. These texts are not distinguished movement for movement by the way their stands is open. It's the same every time. Bach appears in his setting of this piece to be trying to indulge uh, his, and presumably his listener's, preference for musical variety, and indulging the appeal of aria-like settings that form the uh, basis of so many movements in his cantatas. And it's really interesting to see him do this with the text he's provided. So he presents the usual variety of vocal scorings, Opening and closing movements use all four voices, soprano, alto, tenor, bass. Then we have in between three solo movements that exhaustively use all the voices. A movement for alto, a movement for tenor, and the third soloistic piece is a duet for soprano and bass. That is, we get solo, uh, we hear in a soloistic way from all four voices. We get the typical variety of instrumental scores. Outer 2D movements using all the instruments together. Um, and then the inner movements, one each that calls on a string instrument, that's the violin solo in number two, for woodwinds, the two oboes in number three, and brass playing the chorale tune in number four. Again, completely covering the so-called instrumentarium, the chosen instrumental uh, forces for the piece. Again, entirely typical for Bach to be exhaustive in that way. We get Bach's typical harmonic variety. We get outer movements in C major, and then inner movements in G major, E minor, and A minor. And that's especially impressive given his frequent use of the same tune in most of the movements. He does some interesting things to make sure he gets that harmonic variety from movement to movement. And we get the typical variety of musical meter through the piece. No, actually don't. <laughs> Every movement is in triple meter. <coughs> in this. I think it, um, probably in response to the triple meter of the hymn tune, Loba den Herrn, eine Segen It's very striking to have a cantata whose every movement is in triple meter. So what does Bach do with this te text and tune for five movements? The framing movements, both in C major, that's the key that permits and invites the use of trumpets and drums, and invites the use of full vocal and instrumental forces. The opening movement is, as I mentioned, a concerto-like setting built around that celebratory opening ritornello with a familiar syntax, a beginning of the ritornello that establishes the key we're in, a spinning out passage, and then a closing segment to reach a close, and that will recur throughout the movement. In between ritornello statements, we get statements of chorale phrases, mostly one by one, with the tune in the soprano, um, and a typical preparation for the entrance of each phrase, so we get it, we get vocal and instrumental preparation for the entrance of each chorale phrase on the soprano. The lower voices enter one by one, imitating each other, and then the fourth entrance is the soprano with a phrase of the chorale. Now, in old style chorale settings, and I'll remind you if you were here last month, like the one that opened last month's cantatas, in old style settings of chorales, the voices that enter, the preparing the way of the, the soprano melody, enter with material derived from the chorale tune. That is exactly how last month's opening movement worked. That's a technique borrowed from the 16th century, and it emphasizes vocal counterpoint. That is, the um, melodic interaction of four independent voices, three of which are supporting voices, and a fourth which carries the chorale tune in its literal form. But here we get a much more modern setting. The preparatory voices are allied with the instruments. The material they sing is derived from the ritornello, not from the chorale tune. They are part, that is, those voices are part of the concerted texture that surrounds and supports the hymn phrases. And that's really worth listening for, how the voices, the lower three voices here are allied with the instruments. That, of course, makes enormous demands on the singer. And there is a famous contemporary criticism of Johann Sebastian Bach that he expected singers to do what instrumentalists are capable of. 
And you will hear, Bach, I would say you will hear both Bach's expectations and happily a really good realization of precisely that. <laughs> Note that trumpets and drums, who were of course outsiders to the string and oboe concerto style that this movement is fundamentally cast in, stay out during those preparatory entrances of the lower three voices, and they re-enter with the chorale melody, among other things that helps mark uh, the entrance of the chorale to the phrase by phrase as culminations in the, in the movement. So in that first movement, lines one, two, and five of the uh, chorale text are treated this way. Lines three and four are treated together and treated differently. They are declaimed simultaneously by all the voices, partly, I, I think, in response to the text, comet to how come in great numbers. Right? Um, and here, all the voices participate in the chorale element um, over the supporting instrumental concerto text. So Bach is asking you to listen to the relationships here and the interesting vocal instrumental relationships, and in those two short lines in the middle, asking you to listen differently and hear that they're treated differently. The closing movement and closing stanza of the hymn is more or less the expected simple harmonization, but Bach finds a way to integrate trumpets and drums into this movement. Uh, he partly writes for the trumpets um, as if they were additional voices, but partly gives them independent lines especially trumpet one, which has a kind of descant line at the very top of the texture. The inner movements of the chorale are set each as solo movements, as we mentioned. They are all ritornello pieces. They are all aria-like, but Bach would not have called these chorale settings arias. Ar an aria was a piece of newly written poetic text. These aren't arias, these are chorale settings, which explains the rather strange listing um, in the program that just says chorale, 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 chorale. Um, I can tell you, in fact, that if you look at the original performing materials for this piece, um, which uh, survived, um, his copyists were much sloppier about this because they would write out a movement and then to indicate to the other voices, they might say, um, aria alto tasso. Well, it's not an aria for the alto, it's a chorale set, uh, but it was a shorthand they were used to using and they weren't as attuned to the niceties of this as Bach was. Um, getting good help so far. <laughs> Um, each of these movements is different. Uh, number two has a sung chorale cantus firmus, phrase by phrase, a slightly ornamented version of the tune, embedded in an aria-like Ritornello movement with a solo of violin, obbligato. Uh, uh, this movement is in G major, and the chorale is sung in that key, and that makes a useful contrast for Bach to the C major of the opening and closing movements. It also nicely fits the alto range. The tune is moved down four steps from the soprano C major, to, a, uh, to G major, where it nicely fits in alto range. And that's precisely the typical difference in, in this kind of music between soprano and alto range. That they differ by exactly that much. Number four, the next to last movement, is also a cantus firmus setting, phrase by phrase presentation of the chorale tune embedded in a ritornello movement. Here it's a basso continuo piece with no other instrumental obbligato. And in a, it's, if this were an aria, we call it a continuo aria. The bass instruments here provide both the melodic interest in the ritornello and the supporting harmony. But in this movement, there's a twist. The cantus firmus here is instrumental. The voice is not spotlighted as the carrier of the chorale tune, um, as in uh, movement number two, where alto sings the tune. Here, the voice is aligned with the ritornello. Then our tenor is going up. Yep, it is. It's really part of the ritornello. It's yet another example, maybe an even more intense example, of Bach's writing for the voice as though it were an instrument. Yep, that's right. Yes, indeed. This movement is in A minor for Welcome Variety, and that's in a neat trick because the chorale tune is presented in C major nonetheless. One reason to put it in C major is the instrumentation of Bach assigns. It's played by the first trumpet which is somewhat limited in the pitches it can play, it is best suited to tunes in C. So Bach puts the chorale tune in C, yet there's a tension here between the chorale phrases being in C major and the entire movement actually being in A minor. Uh, Bach does some very interesting things to make that happen. There's another detail I want to point out. This line, that chorale line assigned to trumpet one, um, is um, different from the line in the outer movements. Um, because it calls in trumpet one for three pitches that are not really playable, two pitches anyway, that are not really playable on standard instrument. 
and that is so it ga da ba ba da da fine da 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 that ya da da the third note is, is easily playable but the other two really aren't technically available on the instrument now there's two ways around that um, uh, trumpet players developed then and now tricks for bending the playable notes to make your ear think that they were the notes you want. And since you know this tune by that point, your ear will fill in ya da 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 Even what's being, even though what's being played is ya da 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 or something like that. Um, and a good player, we have one in our director, can make, can make you think that. The alternative is to play it on a slide instrument, one to uh, make those pitches available. Um, it looks as if that slide trumpet, or that's how Bach did it the first time he did this piece, was probably not available when he revived this piece later. And so into the oboe one part, he later wrote an insert. He put that chorale tune there, making it clear that in that later performance, that chorale tune was played on oboe one, which uh, interferes somewhat with this um, panoramic view that the three solo movements give you of the three instrument families of the instrumentarium, but it's playable. So you have the choice. So if I understand correctly, what we're going to do is we're going to hear the second time, we're going to hear that piano term is played on the oboe. So you get to hear both versions of this piece. Um, so we'll hear that the second time. The middle movement of the three solo movements is distinctive. It uses the chorale stanza text, and it alludes to the chorale melody in the beginning and is even organized the way the tune is. This is a characteristic Lutheran chorale tune organization of an A phrase, a repeated A phrase, and then a B phrase. This is interesting tune because it's in an unusual meter. It's in um, dactylic pentameter. Yada da 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 right? that, That's an entire line. That's the entire A phrase of the chorale. It's, it's very strange. There's only one other tune in the entire Lutheran repertory of thousands of tunes that, that does that. Um, so it, this piece even respects that organization by having a big musical repeat so that the setting of the first line closely parallels the setting of the second line. But with a duet obligato, um, two oboes, with two voices, soprano and bass, and a new key, that's foreign to the C major we've been hearing, E minor, there is no literal statement of the chorale. The vocal lines at the beginning merely allude to the chorale, and Bach wants you to think of the chorale tune. Um, but this movement stands out as the only one in the piece that doesn't literally sing or play the chorale melody. It's also interestingly the most text responsive, especially in the expressive gesture in the voices and to a certain extent in the instruments at the text. In wie viel Not, in, in how much distress has God got in there for you. So lots of things to listen for in this work. But if you want to think about what sort of cantata this is, you can listen for all the ways in which Bach makes an unconventional libretto into a work that fits so well into the demands and expectations of the typical cantata type. Thank you.